Hello and welcome to what I hope will be a high energy deep dive into the unresolved and urgent question of Myanmar's representation at the United Nations. I'm Chris Gunnis, director of the Myanmar Accountability Project, MAP, which is co-hosting this event with the Asia Pacific Center for the Responsibility to Protect. My thanks to Alex Bellamy, director of the center, and his team for their excellent work in making this webinar happen. Our task today is to come up with a list of practical suggestions on how Myanmar's representation at the UN, which is currently in a state of limbo, can be clarified and made consistent with well-established UN principles and practices. As things currently stand, to put it bluntly, it's a mess. The National Unity Government is represented in the General Assembly by Ambassador Jomo Tun, but in the International Court of Justice, the highest judicial organ of the UN, the junta represents Myanmar. Meanwhile, in the Human Rights Council, as in other UN bodies, the Myanmar seat has been left empty. This is denying the people of Myanmar a voice in the UN, and it urgently needs addressing. Well, I shall introduce our distinguished panel in a moment, but first I'd like to bring in U Aumyo Min, the Human Rights Minister of the National Unity Government, the NUG. Minister Mio, we'll talk about the UN seat, and by the way, thank you very much for giving us of your time. We'll talk about Myanmar's seat in a moment, but first, to give our panel discussion some context, I'd like you, first of all, to give us some idea of the current human rights situation in Myanmar. What are the violations and the abuses of, of greatest concern to you? Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you for organizing this and inviting me um, and the BS first speaker. Um, the human rights situation that is Myanmar has a long history of human rights uh, violation and human rights record. But since the attempted military coup, the situation getting worse and worse. The denying the result of the election and detaining the political leaders is the, just the beginning of a human rights violations. It is against the will of the people. But it is not stopped. That's a, you know, crackdown on the peaceful demonstrators uh, continue in many of the cities. And as a result, many peaceful demonstrators were killed. Now the human rights situation, atrocities spill over many parts of the countries, which have never had any experience of fighting, killing, and burning the villages, especially in the middle part of Myanmar namely Sakai and Mandalay divisions. So that is continuous. So military intensify all kinds of violence against the civilians. Though so they constitute the crime against humanity and war crime in some of the cases, it is also described by the human rights, uh, high commissioners of human rights of the UN. So, so far there's uh, over 2000 people were killed during, uh, especially in the demonstration, but the many, many people were killed across the country without any reasons, particularly in the rural areas. And Minister, then political sorry. prisoners, and also, you know, Please, that has uh, been arrested. Over 11,000 people are arrested and, and 1,200 people are sentenced without any proper legal protections. And especially in the rural areas, more than 22,000 uh, houses are burned down by the military, particularly in the rural area. So this is the you know, tips of the ice belt. Many people right. are living under fear every day and the atrocities stay going on. Minister Mir, thank you for that very good overview of the current human rights situation. I want to ask you, though, about something slightly different now, and that is the question of the uh, democratic credentials of the National Unity Government, because this is an issue which comes up in discussions about the credentials. So give us some idea of the establishment of the energy, its status and its democratic credentials, if you like. Well, the National Unity Government, I would say, is the legitimate government of Myanmar because it is you know, um, uh, assigned by the elected members of the parliament who won the 2000, year 2000 uh, uh, elections. So we are mandated and we are legitimate government. As a, as a government, we are functioning like a government as a, with a good governance system. So we are, you know, working on the human rights documentation, perpetrated by the criminal, in the criminal organization like the military. 
for raising the issue of accountability issue justice. At the same time, NUT is functioning to restore the rule of law, law enforcement, and public administration in many areas which military have no access at all. So we are restoring back functioning as a civilian government for protection of the people and bringing the law enforcement. At the same time, we are engaging with the many international and the government for legitimacy issue of the NUG because we are the legitimate government. So we are engaging with the, um, the government, UN and many other regional organizations that you know, we are very committed to work for accountability and justice issue of the people. Thank you so much. That sets up this debate very well, Minister. And I'd like to move to the matter in hand, which is the current status of Myanmar's representation in the UN as a whole. Um, first of all, where are we? And what is your reaction to the fact that, for example, in the Human Rights Council, uh, the seat is being left empty? Well, before moving to the, the Human Rights Council, let me start with the, the General Assembly. You know, we have in the last 27, 6, 76 General Assembly held in 2021, September, that was a credential issue uh, raised. The, the legitimate, the permanent representative, Ucho Moton, who is loyal to the NUG and the, the, another permanent representative appointed by the military. So that's a credential issue. Who should be their permanent, their permanent representative representing Myanmar? But you know, in the last session, Ucho Moton case was deferred, and he is still at the permanent representative of the of the Myanmar. Um, also, he is making the voices of the people, and also uh, as an amplifier of the voices of the national unity government. But unfortunately, the seat at the Human Rights Council is vacant because the Human Rights Council uh, have not decided the credential issue of the NUG because that decision is just the defer, defer cases of Ucho Moton. So that there's no seat or no Burmese delegation at the Human Rights Council. This is such a, you know, unfortunate because we are the legitimate government. We are representing Myanmar and then elected by the, the uh, election or winning member of parliament and supported by the people. So uh, making the vacant at the Human Rights Council make us miss a lot of opportunities for the NUG to engage and to cooperate for the accountability issue and justice issue, bringing the justice back to the people. So for example, the Myanmar UPR, Universal Periodic Review is being postponed because there's no representative at the Human Rights Council. So we are very de deplored and disappointed at the decision made at the Human Rights Council. And where else are you being denied representation? You mentioned this empty seat at the Human Rights Council. Which are the other bodies? I mentioned the ICJ. But which are the other bodies where you're being, the people of Myanmar, I should say, are being denied representation? Well, this is not consistent, Chris. You know, in many, some other, uh, UN, you can UN function seminar or conference like a WHO and ILO. That's a, that seat was vacant, but some areas, because of the inconsistency of the UN, some are you know accepted the UN representative. So this is this is the issue. That should be a consistent decision and also clear resolution by the UN Secretary uh, General Assembly to make sure who is representing and that, but preferably the NUG representative, Ujo Moto is the one who are representing Myanmar and also designated by the NUG should be representing everybody of the UN. And can I just say to our panelists and also to those um, in the audience that the main purpose of this webinar is to come up with practical suggestions on how those inconsistencies which the minister just talked about can be um, resolved. It's something we're going to be talking about in a second. Before we move away from you, Minister, one question where I'm curious to know where you're being denied a seat. What excuse is the UN or the relevant body giving to the NUG? Well, the UN, many can, countries say that they recognize the states, not the government. This is the common uh, 
reasons and the the reasons given by them. But we saying that yeah, of course you you recognize the state, but we are the government of the state, voted, supported, and also functioning as a legitimate government. So this is the counter argument we always make it. But you know you you can see the result and let's see you know how the military uh, illegally attempt to stage a coup, how they are committing all kinds of atrocities. They are not there in the possession of government. They are the criminals. So uh, competing the seat for delegation and representative with this criminal is nonsense. So that we are the government, legitimated government, and we are very committed to work for their accountability issue, justice issue, and also make sure that the culture of human rights is restored and back to the people of the country. So that okay. the, 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 the issue is not, you know, the argument is not quite strong. Very good. Minister, we're going to start now drawing up that list of practical measures to iron out these inconsistencies. I presume that top of your list is a demand that the NUG should be represented in all UN bodies, not just the General Assembly, but all of them. This is correct. Thank you, Chris. Uh, OK, um, if there's any more that you want to be put on that list, Minister, as the debate continues, then um, please chip in and let us know. Um, but I'd like now to move on um, to uh, Larry Johnson, professorial lecturer at the Vienna Diplomatic Academy and formerly UN Assistant Secretary General for Legal Affairs, and also Rebecca Barber, who, like Larry, has written extensively on this issue. Rebecca is Research Fellow at the Asia-Pacific Centre for the Responsibility to Protect. Larry, as I've said, um, you've been inside the UN in charge of the Office of legal affairs, no less, working on these credentials issues. What are the rules and the procedures for determining who gets to represent a state at the UN, particularly when you have these disputed claims? Well, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to, uh, to join you. Uh, but to, to, to uh, uh, second what you said at the beginning, the whole situation uh, re regarding uh, what to do in the case of what we call rival regimes is a mess. <laughs> um, <clears throat> as you mentioned, the Credentials Committee is a body, a small body, and they are to review pieces of paper that come in from a member of the UN that designate certain individuals as the representative of the given government slash state. <clears throat> and normally the Credentials Committee has a very technical job, which is just to make sure that that piece of paper is in due and proper form, that is signed by one of three magic people, head of state, head of government, or minister of foreign affairs. Uh, so uh, sometimes you will have uh, disputes whether that is indeed the case. But when you have a right, when you have two pieces of paper that come in, that's when things get difficult. Uh, and that's not new. In fact, the first time it arose was in 1950, when you had, uh, you know, the year after uh, Beijing fell to the People's Republic of China, the, the People's Liberation Army, and the Republic of China uh, uh, went to Taiwan. So that arose right away. And the General Assembly adopted a resolution uh, in 1950, which uh, in, 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 it pretty well described this current situation. Difficulties may, I'm quoting, uh, difficulties may arise regarding the representation of a member. Um, and there may be a risk that conflicting decisions may be reached by various organs. So they saw this in 1950. Yeah. And then they went on to say that by virtue of its composition, it's the General Assembly, which is the organ that can best be given, that consideration uh, should, be, uh, should be given to their views, because it's a universal body in the UN, as to uh, who should be the representation. So they then went on to say, when there are rival regimes, the Assembly recommended that the attitude adopted by the Assembly concerning the rival regimes should be taken into account in other organs of the UN and in specialized agencies. So that goes all the way back to 1950. So in theory, what the General Assembly does should be taken into account. 
Now that may sound fairly weak. Um, it doesn't say it's obligatory, but in practice, it is meant that whatever the GA has been doing, other organs of the organization, whether it's a subsidiary like the Human Rights Council or a principal organ like the ICJ, should follow what the General Assembly is doing. Now, in the case of Myanmar, uh, uh, that has meant that the credentials of both uh, the NUG and the junta have been deferred, but orally on the understanding, and I say orally because it was not put into the report as it was in previous years, but it was the understanding in the credentials committee that on the understanding that those who had been uh, seated as Myanmar provisionally would continue with full rights. And that's why the current uh, representative uh, uh, continues to fully function. He votes, he speaks, he's a full member of the General Assembly like any other member state. But that, so, so Larry, unfortunately, if I can... sorry, continue. Uh, say that has not been followed in the Human Rights Council, nor certainly not in the ICJ. And the basic, basically the significance is nobody's minding the shop and somebody's not uh, 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 drawing attention or uh, speaking up enough to follow this 1950 uh, resolution. And I don't know why, whether it's member so, states or the secretary general or the secretariat, I don't know. But at right. least one practical decision, or one practical uh, uh, suggestion would be that the General Assembly, next time it addresses the issue of Myanmar, remind all of the organs of the UN the, of, the, of the existence of 396 and repeat that language that everybody should follow the practice of the General Assembly. Brilliant. I'd like, you've touched on a, full, a, a precedent um, from the 1950s, sorry. I'd like to follow up with Rebecca and to give us a flavour of the way that the General Assembly in the past has dealt with these competing credentials claims. Rebecca. You're on mute. Sorry, Chris. <laughs> um, pleasure to be here speaking with everybody. Um, thanks, Chris, for the question. Yet yeah, there have been a number of occasions on the past where um, decisions have had to be made about the issue of who should represent a state. Prior to around the 1990s, decisions were typically made on the basis of which authority exercised effective control over the territory of the state in question. In the 1990s though, the General Assembly's practice began to shift and we began to see a de decrease in the weight attached to effective control and increased attention to issues such as constitutionality and democratic legitimacy. And if we look at the cases since around 1990, most of the cases in which a government's representation at the UN have been in dispute can be considered in three broad groups. In the first group, the ousted democratically elected government continued to submit credentials to the General Assembly, but the usurping power, so coup regime or insurgents did not submit their credentials. The cases in that group are Liberia and Haiti and Sierra Leone in the 90s, Afghanistan in 1996 and Honduras in 2009. And in all of those cases except Afghanistan, the General Assembly accepted the credentials submitted by the deposed government, despite that government lacking effective control. In the case of Afghanistan in 1996, the General Assembly deferred its decision on representation, leaving the previously credentialed representative, i.e. representing the deposed democratically elected government, provisionally in place. In the second group of cases, the usurping power submitted credentials, but the deposed government did not. That was the case in Guinea and Madagascar in 2009. And in both of those cases, the General Assembly deferred its decision on representation explicitly on the understanding that the previously credentialed representatives would participate provisionally in the General Assembly. And then in the third group of cases, the de deposed democratically elected government and the usurping power both submitted credentials to the General Assembly. 
and cases in that category include Afghanistan between 1997 and 2000, Cambodia in 97, Guinea-Bissau in 2012, and then of course Myanmar and also Afghanistan last year. In the case of Afghanistan in the 90s and Guinea-Bissau, the General Assembly deferred its decision explicitly on the understanding that the previously credentialed representatives would remain provisionally in place. In, so in the case of Cambodia, the General Assembly also deferred its decision, but on the understanding also explicitly that Cambodia's seat at the General Assembly would remain temporarily unoccupied. And then in the case of Myanmar last year and also Afghanistan, similarly, the General Assembly again deferred its decision. But on this occasion, as Larry mentioned, it didn't explicitly stipulate that the previously credentialed representatives were to remain in place. It was just left to be assumed that that was to be the case. There are a small number of other cases that don't fall into those groups. And I might just mention Venezuela. In Venezuela, President Maduro has remained in power as a result of elections that are widely regarded as flawed. And many states have said that they don't recognize the legitimacy of his government. His representatives have continued to submit credentials to the General Assembly and in the absence of any competing credentials, those have been accepted. So I think just, just to summarize those cases, since the 1990s, in almost all cases where the issue of governance has been disputed, whether the credentials have been submitted by both or only one of the authorities vying for power, the General Assembly has taken an approach that has in effect favored the democratically elected government. The only one of those cases in which the General Assembly recognized the credentials of a government that came to power or retained power through undemocratic or unconstitutional means was Venezuela. And so I think the approach taken in the Venezuelan case seems a bit out of sync with the General Assembly's preferred approach. But I think important to note that in the Venezuelan case, the General Assembly was not and has not in fact been presented with competing credentials. So not exactly comparable to the Myanmar scenario. That's, that, that's very helpful, Rebecca. And just to add that if anyone is interested in any further bedside reading, there is actually a very long <laughs> legal opinion, which is co-authored by none other than uh, Rebecca and Chris Sadotti, amongst other um, legal um, authorities, international legal scholars, which is available on Matt's website, and I can show people in that direction, point people in that direction if they're interested. I'd like to go back, uh, if I may, Larry, um, to yes. you. I said in my introduction that um, the junta is represented at the International Court of Justice, as Minister Mio and others have been saying, um, at the Human Rights Council and the World Health Assembly and others, um, the energy, the, the seat is empty. Um, what is the significance of that? Uh, before I come to that question, let me complete um, what I had said earlier about this old Please. 1950 resolution, and it fits into what Rebecca said. Uh, back in 1950, when you had the dispute a bit about the representation of China, uh, the legal office gave a confidential memo to the then Secretary General Trick V. Lee, which basically uh, followed the traditional bilateral, um, and this the minister referred to, bilateral relations test, which was effective control, not necessarily values, but who's in charge of the territory, who's in charge of the population, who's in charge of the money, who's in charge of the military, territory, all of that. Um, this was leaked, anyway, that's a whole other story. But when it came to the General Assembly, the whole issue, uh, in that resolution, the General Assembly rejected that effective control test. By implication, it said that whenever more than one authority claims to be the government entitled to represent a member state, and it becomes a matter of controversy, this is the test that the General Assembly decided. The question should be considered in the light of the purposes and principles of the United Nations, of the Charter, and circumstances of each case. So it leaves it completely wide open. 
So as Rebecca says, in many, in many times, in many cases, it ends up that the democratic government has been seated, if there's a rival, in the GA. Uh, and then you have the, the problem of Venezuela. So from the very beginning, you had a little bit of a disconnect between bilateral relations. And don't forget that in the 50s and the 60s, who had representation in Beijing? The Brits. The UK consistently recognized People's Republic of China, while the United States was ranting and railing against the Red Chinese and the communists and so on and so forth. So this continues to this day. And uh, I, I will come back to the Maduro case because it seems to me that uh, you have that confusion and that conflict between a bilateral relationship and the multilateral that continues in the UN. Look at the European countries that have accepted Guaido. Why? Because he's the democratic government. But why, why, do, the, why, why, why do the people of Venezuela need, uh, uh, have representation in various European capitals, but not the people of Myanmar? Because those same European countries that claim they're defenders of human rights do not recognize the NUG bilaterally. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it, of course, to, to coin a phrase, it's complicated. But yep. uh, if you're going to look at values, then some of those that teach values the most should, uh, should practice them. And actually, we're going to come back, I think it'd be relevant to ask Minister Mio about the question of recognition of the NUG, which I think is going to prove quite decisive in this debate. But before I do, Larry, to come back to you and insist on answering that oh, question, yeah. please, about the significance of the empty seat and the junta at the ICJ. Well, in general, uh, the lack of consistency in, and, and the failure of these other organs and bodies to follow the General Assembly practice, of course, undermines the position of the uh, current permanent representative in New York and under, undermines, in my view, the authority of the General Assembly as the universal body, uh, as, as argued and as explained in 1950. So it's a it's a it's an unfortunate. Now, of course, it can go either ways. If tomorrow the General Assembly recognized the junta, I would be making the same argument that whatever the General Assembly decides, everybody should follow. So, <laughs> but the, the basic problem. Yeah, yeah. I mean, exactly. This is the problem. In fact, some people would have would have said we shouldn't really even be having this program because it it airs and and exposes this very issue. And there are those that will argue that for goodness sake, if the, if, if the, if the judicial, if the principal judicial organ of the United Nations has recognized, not technically, but has agreed that the junta speaks for the state of Myanmar, why is it not so in the General Assembly? That's the significance. Mm. And what, in fact, Human Rights Watch has said in one of its publications, which said that it's of no relevance to the General Assembly, in my view, is completely wrong and, 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 yeah. and is not correct that what happened in the ICJ, maybe human rights people thought that it was good to have the junta in the docket to feel the heat. But the ICJ can come out with the, the condemnations of the genocidal killers of the of the junta uh, without them actually being there, and uh, so you know all, there are all kinds of arguments on the in, or, yeah, or yeah, positions, yeah, yeah. positions so, in the ICJ yeah. we don't want to go into, but yeah, yeah, it was bad. It was bad. So. Dear panelists, time presses. I want to ask a couple of quick questions to both Rebecca and Larry quickly um, to add to that list. So we've got Minister Mio saying representation across the board in all areas. We've got Larry talking about resolution 396 and that the language of that being repeated by the General Assembly in September to December. Um, Rebecca, you've written a bit about Honduras. So tell us briefly about that and then I'll go back to Larry to see if he wants to add anything more to the list. Rebecca. Yeah, so I think, I think we need to I just want to say something about this issue of lack of guidance by the General Assembly and this need for clearer guidance from the General Assembly that Larry's kind of touched on and I've kind of touched on, but I think it's so important that it's worth really spelling out. So we've discussed the fact that last year when the General Assembly's Credentials Committee was faced with this issue of competing credentials by the Junta and the NUG, it recommended that the General Assembly defer its decision on representation. And because of the General Assembly's rules of procedure, which Larry's talked about, by default, that decision allowed the current incumbent 
now speaking for the NUG to remain in his seat, but without the General Assembly having explicitly said so. In the past, as Larry's mentioned and I've mentioned, when the General Assembly has deferred its decisions on credentials, it has said ex explicitly that the deferral is on the understanding that the current representative will remain in place with all the same rights and privileges of other representatives. So this doesn't send as clear a signal as actually accepting the credentials of the preferred representative, but it does provide some important guidance to other parts of the UN regarding who should represent the state in question. But in relation to Myanmar last year, the General Assembly deferred its decision on representation without stipulating that the deferral was on the understanding that Myanmar's previously credentialed representative would remain provisionally seated. Now, I don't know if that was an oversight or if it was intentional, um, but I think that that lack of clear guidance um, is, is the reason for, for some of the difficulties that we're now facing. And how is that the resolved? Reason that, sorry? How can that be resolved? I, I'm asking because time is pressing. How can that be well, resolved? It, it, it can be resolved by the General Assembly passing a resolution explicitly expressing its views, not necessarily connected with the credentials process, but explicitly expressing its views on who is the legitimate government of Myanmar. And it can do that outside the credentials process, and it has done so on numerous occasions in the past. And you mentioned Honduras. So following the military coup in Honduras, the General Assembly passed a resolution, nothing to do with the credentials process, demanding the restoration of the legitimate and constitutional government of Honduras and calling on states to recognise no government other than that of the constitutional president. Great, great. thank you. Yeah, thank you. Rebecca, sorry to cut you off, but we have to press. Larry, is there anything you would like to add to this list? Um, yes, uh, but maybe it's for future discussion, but in any event, what civil society can do in those European countries that um, have recognized Guaido to pressure them, why have they not recognized the NUG? Mm. Yep, great idea. Okay, um, let us um, move on. Um, I'd like to bring in Chris Sadoffi. And by the way, I can see that we're getting some questions in the Q&A box. So please, members of the audience, keep um, doing that. I see we have a question from Conine. Salzman, who I believe is in Australia, but please keep those questions um, coming in. Chris, as you probably know, many of you, is the founding member of the Special Advisory Council for Myanmar, SAC-M, and formerly a member of the Independent International Fact-Finding Mission on Myanmar. Chris, what can addressing the issue of recognition of the NUG um, contribute to addressing the overall crisis in Myanmar? Uh, thanks, Chris, and um, good night to everybody from Sydney. Uh, recognising the NUG will be a, a, an important step towards resolving the situation in Myanmar. Um, the regrettable fact is that states have been um, vocal in some cases in expressing their condemnation of the coup, as they should be, but not particularly active in most cases and not particularly effective in others in trying to ensure an appropriate resolution. Um, here, perhaps the best example is the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, which in um, April last year, April 24 last year, adopted a five point consensus, um, which even the dictator in chief agreed to, but then went home and, um, and, and shunned. And ASEAN has done nothing since. Uh, in fact, uh, ASEAN and particularly its current chair, Prime Minister Hun Sen of Cambodia, have been uh, humiliated, um, uh, humiliated by Senior General Min Aung Hlaing and his colleagues in the military dictatorship uh, because ASEAN has been um, utterly ineffective in trying to implement its consensus. The Security Council has hid behind ASEAN. The Security Council, the most dysfunctional organ in the entire United Nations system, hiding behind ASEAN, which is unable to do anything effective on the ground in Southeast Asia. So recognition of the national unity government, as it should be recognized, uh, is a necessary step in seeking to resolve the situation in Myanmar and ending the violence, the injustice, 
and the domination of these military terrorists. It's as simple as that. And Chris, um, SACM, what have you guys been doing in SACM? And what action would you like to see the NUG and the UN take? I mean, hearing the panel speak, it seems there are overwhelming reasons in favour of this issue being resolved in favour of the NUG. And yet that hasn't happened. What does the UN have to do and what do others have to do? Well, I think the first step is to address the problem rather than avoiding it. Um, I agree completely with the analysis that Larry has given and that Rebecca has given, but I have one fundamental disagreement with Larry. Larry said it's complicated. It's not. It's simple. Mm. All we need is for the United Nations membership to do their job and the organs of the United Nations to do their job. Um, Minister Mio has referred to the fact that the NUG gets told states recognise states, not governments. That's absolutely correct, but it's also a, a, a smokescreen behind which they hide. They have to accept representatives of states in the United Nations and indeed in their own capitals. We still have representatives of the dictators sitting in most capitals occupying Myanmar embassies in the same way as we have the United Nations organs avoiding the basic question. No matter how we look at it, the NUG is entitled to be seated in capitals of states as representatives, diplomatic representatives, and in the United Nations. If we use the test of legitimacy that Rebecca has described, the NUG wins 100 points to nil for the military. If we use the old test of effective control, again, the NUG wins. Um, as my friend Kornang Salzman points out, the military has never been in fully in control of the territory of Myanmar. Um, throughout Myanmar's history since independence, various ethnic armies and their political representatives have controlled many of the ethnic nationality states in Myanmar. And that remains the case today. And now for the first time, we are even seeing the military's effective control of central Myanmar, the Bama area of Myanmar, being challenged. The best you can say about the military's effective control is that they have fortified the capital, Napidor, like a medieval castle, and they control the airport in Yangon. That's about it for total effective control. The, the acting president of the NUG has said that the NUG and its allies effectively control without challenge around about 40% of the country, and the rest is contested. So if we take an effective control test, the NUG gets 70 points and the military at best gets 20. That's about it. So no matter how we look at it, it's not complicated, it's simple. The NUG should be seated in the United Nations. Great, Chris, I've got one more question to ask you. I just want to let, give Larry some comeback in a second, Larry. And, and, and I will be asking you, if you don't mind, about the, um, uh, the, the clarity that could be given by the office you used to be in charge of, the Office of Legal Affairs. But Chris, one last question for you. You said that the Security Council is the most dysfunctional organ of the entire United Nations system. I think given what, we've, what we know about Russia, the threat of Russian and Chinese vetoes, we'd all agree on that. Yet we do have Britain, the former colonial power, which bequeathed to Myanmar the total mess that it's in, as it's done in many other colonies, is the pen holder in New York and could itself um, be doing something. We've got progressive ASEAN members like Indonesia, where civil society um, is very active. What would you like those to do, specifically the pen holder um, and progressive um, parts of ASEAN like Indonesia and like Malaysia? Indonesia in particular, Chris. Well, in the Security Council, um, no, no, like the Security Council. Oh, sorry, sorry, please. Yes, the Security yeah. Council. In the Security Council, I would like to see those who are members of the Security Council forcing a vote. There has not been a resolution put before the Security Council on Myanmar since this crisis began. Indeed, not since the crisis of the Rohingya began in 2017. The attitude from states like the United Kingdom, the United States, France, has been that uh, Russia and or China will veto and we're not going to put up a resolution unless we are satisfied that it will pass. Now, here we have a double standard. That hasn't worried them when it comes to Ukraine, when they knew that Russia would veto the resolution. It hasn't worried them when it's come to Syria, similarly when Syrian motions have been put up. And yet it seems that Myanmar simply isn't important enough to put up a resolution. And especially now that the General Assembly has decided that vetoes in the Security Council have to be explained, 
there is no longer any excuse for not putting up a resolution. And if Russia wants to veto, if China wants to veto, let them do so and let them explain themselves. Let them be held accountable in the General Assembly. So that's the first thing. ASEAN, Indonesia will be chair of ASEAN next year. And this embarrassing period of, of Cambodia chairing ASEAN will be at an end. Um, Indonesia is an important state. Um, Indonesia is a state that recognizes what's happened in Myanmar and is far more inclined to act. Uh, I don't think we're going to see very much possible within ASEAN this year, but ha I have high hopes for next year. Okay, and let's just quickly go to Larry before we go over to Zunetta. Um, Larry, uh, Chris said the only area he disagreed with you was that it was actually very simple, not complicated. Um, maybe leaving that aside, if you were in charge of the Office of Legal Affairs now, what would you like to see them do? What could they do in um, you know, a universe where such things happened? Well, on, on that uh, particular question, I think it is uh, simple, which is, uh, and there's no, and I'm not saying whether the uh, Office of Legal Affairs has not done this, it's just they don't, uh, obviously for lawyers and, and clients, uh, nothing is, is public on that, but the, the office would remind everyone of the existence of 396 and uh, ask them to follow it. It would, of course, help if the General Assembly repeated it or the council. But in terms of, I never said it was complicated as such, uh, it's, it's very simple for all of us sitting around and the NGOs and the academic community, but there's one very important fact of life. Uh, we don't decide anything. Governments decide we don't. So it's the governments that have to be hit and they can be hit with inconsistency and hi hypocrisy. And that's the point that uh, Rebecca and others have made. Look at the Taliban. The Taliban has never been seated in the organization. And talk about effective control. Effective control is not the test. Never has been from 1950 on. You have values in there, purposes and principles. So why isn't the same uh, being applied in the case of Myanmar? Uh, all during the Taliban regime and even today, even today when you don't even have a government in Afghanistan, a counter government, a rival, somebody else is sitting for Afghanistan, not the Taliban. But yet, in, and of course, the minister cannot say this. He cannot say that because he depends on Europeans and those in favor of democracy for support. But other people can tell the Europeans, be consistent. Don't be hypocritical. Why are you, why are you allowing Maduro to sit in the General Assembly without a peep? Maybe you don't, maybe you need rival credentials. But anyway, yep. uh, there's a problem there. Okay, very good. I'd like to move over to uh, Zunetta uh, Liddell, giving us the all-important view from the ground. Zunetta is an international human rights scholar, an activist, an advisor to civil society organizations in Myanmar. Zunetta, let us talk about the situation on the ground and the practical implications of the NUG being excluded from UN bodies for civil society working on the ground. I think, I mean, I would say that the, 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 the fundam most fundamental implication is that uh, people in Myanmar have totally lost faith in the UN at all levels. So both at the political level, at the human rights level, and also, you know, on the ground in terms of, you know, the, the humanitarian work they are or not doing in, in country. So I think, uh, you know, from most this is we've heard all the different examples of, of what's happened in other countries and what other governments but for most people in Myanmar it seems like a completely simple problem they elected uh, a new government in 19, in 2020 uh, they won the 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 National League for Democracy won 86 percent of the seats uh, under a constitution which was written by the military to give the military 25% of the seats and, uh, you know, in, ensured the military's continued role in politics in the country forever. Under that system, they won an election and then the military staged a coup. So it's quite clear to them who is the legitimate government. And in fact, the NUG is not only the legitimate government because of that election and because of those MPs that formed the uh, committee representing the People's Luto, but they also include in the national unity government members of the ethnic, uh, ethnic armed groups that have, as um, Chris has, has described, have had their own territories within the country for decades. 
they are also part that like most of the deputy ministers in the national unity government are from those ethnic groups so it's a for the first time in Myanmar it's a very unified government they uh, you know in include uh, ethnic groups that were previously fighting each other, they weren't actually fighting each other, they were fighting the military. The people of Myanmar have been fighting the military since uh, 1962, actually. <laughs> so, uh, and for the first time, they had an elect, they had a, you know, they had, for the second time rather, they had an election in which a, a, their, their chosen government was elected and they staged a coup. So the mm you know, there is no legitimacy. And for the impact on civil society, it just basically means that they realize that if they want to change their government, they cannot rely on anyone to help them. The UN is not going to help them. And for example, the only reason why Jo Moton is actually supporting the NUG is because of his individual decision to do that. You know, he, he and many other diplomats uh, chose it could not in all conscience represent the military after the coup and so he is now working with the national unity government and, it was know, his personal I, choice to do that and if i may take you back to the situation on the ground um is this confusion playing out on the ground where certain un organizations for example are working with the junta or recognizing the junta or moving towards working with the junta is that a problem we're seeing yeah, well, the, you know, the, the UN in Myanmar um, uh, obviously has to abide by the humanitarian principles of neutrality and impartiality. But in Myanmar, that is basically meant that they will not talk to the national unity government and the forces in um, opposing the military, but they only talk to the military. So, for example, the head of UNICEF in, in Yangon recently photographed having a nice cozy chat with, uh, with Min Ong Lai. Uh, the World Food Programme was able to finally deliver some aid to Kareni State, where more than half the population is uh, living, in internal, in, living as internally displaced persons in the jungle due to the fighting there. And the WFP delivered the food in the capital city, Loiko, uh, which was the, administered by the military. So the military took the lists of all the people that was going to receive the rice. The rice was then found two weeks later by a group that we're working with on, on the ground in the market, because the people in Loiko were not the people that are IDPs. They are not the people that needed the rice. So there's this double standard. And I think, frankly, the real problem is actually the lack of leadership in the UN. These inconsistencies just should not be happening. And the so, Secretary Zuna, General so himself needs to take some responsibility for having, no, having taken no action to lead a discussion on Myanmar. So Zunesh, the question I'm asking all the panelists, add to that list, that list of practical suggestions for ironing out these inconsistencies. You've mentioned yeah, some leadership, leadership from the Secretary General. I mean, we have on the human rights side, there are some excellent, you know, that Tom Andrews, a special rapporteur, is doing a fantastic job. Nolene Hazer, uh, the, the special envoy, is doing a fantastic job. And most recently, her main point was that people need to understand the realities on the ground in Myanmar. What you can see in Yangon is not the reality in the rest of the country. In the rest of the country, as uh, Minister Om Yomin and, 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 and Chris have said, in the rest of the country, the military is not in control. And in those areas, people really need help. OK, uh, I think we need to uh, look at some questions. Um, we have uh, Damon Lilly asking whether it would take a separate UN resolution. Rebecca, this is something you've talked about, as well as the Credentials committing, Committee doing the sorts of things that, that Larry has suggested, recognition of uh, the language of um, 396, I think the resolution was. Um, would it need a, would a second res a, a specific resolution on, on the Credentials question be helpful, Rebecca? Yeah, so we're talking about two different things. There's the decision that the general the general assembly makes on the recommendation of the credentials committee on who represent who is going to represent a state at well next year the 77th session of the general assembly 
but I think what we're talking about more broadly in terms of a general assembly resolution beyond the credentials process is a general assembly resolution in the same vein as Honduras or Haiti, which makes a general statement and general assembly resolutions in the past have taken various different forms on who the general assembly regards as the legitimate government of the state. So for instance, in Honduras, when it said it made a called for the restoration of the legitimate government and called on states not to recognize no government other than that of the constitutional president, that wasn't anything to do with the credentials process. So yeah, we are talking about a separate general assembly, assembly resolution that makes a recommendation on who UN bodies, the UN system at large, treats as the representative of Myanmar, not just at the General Assembly's session next year, but across the UN system as a whole. Mm. And can I ask a question which I think is rightly put to Minister Mio, who will have to unmute himself to answer it. Um, Minister Mio, um, you know, we've heard the various descriptions of the various areas of confusion. What would you like? What's your message to the UN? We've heard about humanitarian leadership and political leadership from Zuneta that says it's essential. We've had all sorts of suggestions, but what do you say um, to the UN system as a whole? What do you want? When UN was founded for promotion and protection of human rights of every humanity, the issue of Myanmar is a human rights issue. It's a human rights crisis. So that the UN should stand up firmly and strongly for the principle of human rights of the, 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 the country. So that we have enough statement of letter of concern and letter letter of you know um you know um the strong concern on Myanmar, but statement does not uh, does not help for the actual change. We need the mm -hmm. statement followed by the concrete actions. So, like yep. you know, the the issue of Myanmar is not complicated, like Chris mentioned. It's uh, very simple. Recognize the NUG as the legitimated, as the way it is. And then mm. engaging with the NUG and also civil society of the Myanmar for protection of human rights. And then to take the military accountable for all the crimes they have committed using all existing UN mechanisms and all other possible criminal mechanisms that would put the justice back to the people and make the military accountable for all the crimes. But Minister Mio, if I can ask you, you heard Chris talking earlier about how essential it is for the NUG to have recognition. You heard Larry say that the, the member states need to take the lead. Where do we stand briefly on the question of member state recognition of the NUG? You've certainly been making progress. There have been meetings, but where exactly do we stand briefly? Yeah, you know, we, I have been engaging with the many uh, individual the missions and the, uh, some other, other countries. The clear message for most of the countries, they, they ha have not recognized the military as the legitimate government. But the question of recognition NUG is another step. They are engaging with the NUG as the government, not without, not legal recognition NUG as the legitimate government. So engagement is welcome. Yeah, that's right. But you know, we can do that lots of, you know, uh, bringing their uh, accountability issues and cooperating for the humanitarian crisis but recognition is must so some some countries said they have an interest of their embassies of some of the the business interest uh, for with with Myanmar so I my question is not the self-interest but interest for democracy an interest for the value of the principle of the UN and then the justice is a must. So we mm. should put the, the issue of the, the principle and value first, rather than the self-interest of the yeah. individual country. And we have a question from Tintin um, in the Q&A box, which is about this very question. He's asking, is it contrary to the mandate of UN organizations to be um, working with the military regime? Zunetta, maybe one for you, or Chris, maybe one, Chris Sidotti, maybe one for you. You'll need to unmute yourselves. 
Go Zoom ahead, Chris. <laughs> no, no, you go. <laughs> oh, this the sudden attack of shyness okay. by two panelists. Well, I, okay, Zoom, you yeah. go first. Yeah, I mean the. Uh, I, I mean, as as the minister Om Yamin just said, I, I, it obviously is. Um, but I think in terms of uh, the UN agencies on the ground, um, the their mandate is to provide humanitarian assistance in a neutral and impartial way, which does mean that they should therefore be negotiating, be cooperating with all sides to the conflict not just the military and that is where they are you know not fulfilling their mandate and if that means that they can't do it from inside Myanmar then do it from the borders plenty of assistance is getting through um, by groups that are not based in Yangon and there is no necessity as we've seen in Syria as we've seen in other countries there is no necessity for the UN to have to only work from in Yangon and if, especially given the fact that most of the foreign uh, uh, representatives of those UN agencies have not been able to get their visas and are based in Bangkok anyway. Mm. Um, I've got a, a separate question um, for Chris. I want to ask you um, about the Office of Legal Affairs, and this is something which Larry might want to um, talk about also. What would you like to see from the OLA, which, as far as I understood, was mandated to provide member states with legal guidance? If a member state wrote to OLA and asked for guidance, surely they'd have to apply. So how do you rate their performance and what would you like from them, Chris? Well, Larry's the expert on OLA rather than me. Um, the only thing that I would say is that I'd like to see some public advice come out of OLA. Um, OLA tends to work behind the scenes, as I understand it, uh, and, and tends to work as an advisor to UN secretariat, UN agencies, not to individual member states. Um, but because the OLA has the expertise, it is uniquely placed to provide strong, clear public advice on these kinds of issues. And, and I think that's necessary at this stage. And Chris, before I go back to Larry on that, um, would you like to see the Credentials Committee not deferring the decision and actually making a decision on this? I, I, would, I would certainly like that. I can't see any, any reason to continue deferring it. Um, and under the current circumstances, I see every reason to make a decision. I mean, there are real questions about whether the United Nations is in breach of its own charter. Um, there is a provision in the charter for the suspension of a member state under certain circumstances. That action has, been not, has not been taken in relation to Myanmar. The people of Myanmar are therefore entitled to be represented in all UN forums and to have their representatives exercise a vote. So action has not been taken, which is resulting in my view, in a breach of the United Nations charter by not permitting Myanmar to be present represented and voting in all UN forums. So okay, a decision thank you. is required. Thank you so much, Chris. Larry, please, a word from you about OLA. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, it's not just any office. It's an office of lawyers giving legal advice. And legal advice to clients is always confidential. Um, and therefore, that will can be expected to continue. It's not there to give public uh, advice. It's there to give advice to... The Secretary General and other members of the Secretariat and to UN bodies. It does not give legal advice to individual countries. How many times do you think somebody would have loved the legal advice to give in a legal opinion whether Guantanamo Bay was legal or not? You know, the, you know, the, the US base there. All kinds of questions could have been asked to the legal counsel which would serve individual political interests. So they all have their own lawyers. So whenever we get a question like that, we'll say, fine, you have your own attorney general, you have your own legal advisor, go ask them, don't ask us. But if you have a committee or a body or the presiding officer that asks the, the, the legal uh, counsel for an opinion, he will give it. Um, but uh, well, the I'm Secretary sorry, what, General, you know, right? I mean, th this also goes back general to the problem get... of the absence of leadership. Yeah, that, that in terms of the leadership of the Secretary General and what his powers are and whatever, that is another issue. I don't know because I haven't been there for over 10 years. But I will say that uh, a, a lot of advice is given under the table and behind closed doors, as you say, but that's in the nature of giving legal advice. That's in every society, at least in, in every Western society. So, but, but the other angle you wanted me to uh, address, uh, Chris? I, I just wanted to ask a bit about what you think, uh, you, you've mentioned what um, OLA oh. um, 
Yes. Sorry, please. But let me let me throw one thing in. It seems to be a misunderstanding. Neither the Secretary General nor anybody in the Secretariat adopts resolutions. Resolutions are adopted by something called governments, sure. not nice people. Yep. So why hasn't there been a decision in the Credentials Committee? Why hasn't Rebecca's idea of having just a plain old simple resolution that says everybody agrees NUG is because they don't have the votes. They don't right. have the votes. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. a matter Good of point. voting. Uh, I okay. am going to come out with the list. Thank you, Larry. Indeed. I'm going to come out with the list and then I'm going to give the final words to Minister Mio. So on my list, I have the UN Secretariat to clarify the status of Myanmar's representation in all bodies. Um, OLA perhaps to come out with clear guidance, whether that can be public or not, as Larry's just said, that may not be possible. Concerned states to table resolution in the Haiti model or the Honduras model in the GA, make it quite clear that the NUG is the legitimate government. The Credentials Committee, as Larry has suggested, adopting specific language, um, perhaps um, similar to Resolution 396, I think it was. Um, all UN agencies in Myanmar not to legitimize um, the junta, um, as in the UNICEF debacle, which um, Zunetta spoke about. We had Minister Mio saying that the UN must, in all its bodies across the board, um, must recognize the NUG. We had Chris's suggestion um, of forcing a vote in the Security Council to bring to smoke um, countries out. Indonesia, as the chair of ASEAN next year, taking um, a more um, robust attitude. We had Zunetta's idea of more robust leadership from the Secretary General. Um, I think that's pretty much all. Oh, and we had Larry's idea of civil society um, in various parts of Europe, pointing out the inconsistencies in relation to Venezuela versus um, Myanmar. Larry, I see you shaking your finger. Is there something you want yeah. to add? Actually, it should be uh, Western governments must be consistent okay. in terms of supporting democracy. And at the same time, mouthing great words about supporting and go, what, go to your own governments, go to Australia, go to the United States, go to the United Kingdom and say, why don't you recognize the NUG? Okay, and, right. And also fine, fine. They can, and they the, can, the, in the UN, they could do it. In the UN, they could do it, but they're not doing it. And to me, the failure is on the part of democracies that supposedly support the NUG, but do not do so in the UN. Great. Um, I think we've drawn up a list, but I would like to give the closing words to Minister Mio. Really, please sum this up for us from your perspective. Um, where do we go from here? You, you need to unmute yourself, sir. Yeah, we have come up with a very excellent ideas and the call for the UN and our other individual governments. So this is the things that we need to follow up and keep fighting and, and engaging with the other the important persons. So Myanmar people are very strong, resilient, and you know, sacrifice their life and they are taking all the risks. So, but you know, that we understand that the power of people in the country is the must. But at the same time, with the support and complementary from the international support, we can make our victory much sooner than you know later. So that is, we need all your round support to take the action. Uh, I want to say that that's, you know, in the mindset of the people, sometimes people see that united nothing. It is the, the common joke of the Myanmar people. So we don't want to have that kind of bad image of the UN in the heart of the Myanmar people, but UN with, with the concrete action of the all member states. Bravo, Minister Mo, I'm afraid we really have to end it here. There's so much more to say. Thank you so much, Minister Mio, for joining us. It's been a real honor and a pleasure for us to have you on this panel. Can I also thank our panelists? Really, it's it's such it's such, it's so great to hear these authoritative voices um, speaking um, as they have done, and it's very helpful. Perhaps Rebecca, we can draw up a list of all of these things um, that are being put forward and circulate them somehow on your website or somewhere else. I don't know how you want to deal with that, um, but. Thank you all, Chris, Larry, Rebecca, and Zunetta. And of course, thank you very much for the Asia Pacific Centre for the responsibility to protect. And thank you all in the audience for listening. From all of us, goodbye. <laughs>